take this for granted, um, coming to a place and being with others who also love you and also want to share their love for you, Father God. Um, we just want to indulge in this, and we just ask for your Holy Spirit um, to fill this place, Lord, and we just give our hearts to you, Lord. We want to posture our hearts, and we want to bow down to you spiritually, Lord. Um, we want to put our lives aside and make you the center of our life, Lord. We just love you, we thank you. Just to breathe. 
fun to hear the rain pouring outside as we're singing. I'm like listening to it. It's so peaceful. How perfect to come and brave the rain and just worship together. From the highest to the highs to the depths of the sea. Thank you. 
for you tonight with grateful hearts and um, no matter the week no matter the day lord we always have something to be thankful for so would we just truly honor you and truly say you are amazing god so would you just continue to go before us father would you speak to our hearts would you help us to listen most importantly father and just thank you again for this time that we have in your name we pray So um, you guys can be seated. I'm going to do like Marty. I'm going to have you stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, so we can do a little exercise, get our cardio going. Uh, I'm a coach. So um, so earlier today, it's the song we just sang, Coming Back to the Heart of Worship. And I was watching this video earlier today. It was a combination of, like, sports stars and celebrities who were being interviewed, giving thanks to God, and then some of them would praise the name of their Lord Jesus Christ. And I was thinking, as we were singing, talks about coming back to the heart of worship because it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. You know, the Bible says there's no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. And um, I think when we praise some, we give God praise for something, we need to use the name of Jesus Christ because it separates, because this video also went on and showed uh, some celebrity who thanked God for this award, but then in another clip was thanking the LGBTQ community for supporting her and blah, blah, blah. So I think we need to be, we need to make sure that we're praising the name of Jesus Christ because that's our Lord, that's our God, that's our Savior. So anyway, 
we are going to be. We are going, I got to remember, I can't move. Um, we're going to be in Acts 14, 21 through 28. Marty asked me if I would uh, teach last week, and um, of course, I, it's hard to say no to Marty, so you always say, yeah, sure, no problem. Um, him and Rick, you know, if they ask you to do something, guy, and you guys all know this, Gary, Dave, you guys all know this. When they ask you to do something, you, you just say yes, you know, and then you try and figure out how you're going to do it, so <laughs> just get her done, right? Get her done. Um, <laughs> So anyway, um, the title of this is um, The Making of Disciples, and the subtitle is Strength is Restored When Hope is Restored. Strength is Restored When Hope is Restored. So Paul and Barnabas have went on this uh, missions trip to all these different cities, preaching the gospel, bringing people to faith, getting kicked out of cities, getting stoned to death, well, they thought he was dead, um, being worshipped as a god. Um, and um, so there were a lot of converts as they went through. You know, I had a list of all the cities because there's a lot of them. Uh, Attilia, Anatok, Iconian, Lystra, Derbe, Perga, and I think there was another one. So they went through these cities, and, you know, traveling for us, it's easy. You know, we get in a car, and we drive, and we're there. You know, these, these guys are walking. I mean, they're walking. Can you imagine? Marty says, hey, we're going to do a missions trip. Or, or, or Rick says, we're going to go do, hand out some flyers, but we got to walk to Paris, you know? So, uh, or we got to walk to San Bernardino. You know, we, we get in our cars, we're there in, you know, a few minutes. Um, these guys are walking, you know? I mean, maybe they had a camel. I don't know. Did they have a camel, Marty? I don't know if that. Maybe they had a camel. They definitely didn't have transportation like we have with air conditioning and uh, places to stop. So as they're going through these regions and, you know, there's a lot of hostility that's uh, directed at them. Um, they are, like I said, Paul is stoned in Anatok, Anatok because they hated him and they thought he was dead. And uh, but he wasn't, you know, God revived him, got him, went back to work. But um so now you have all these disciples in these church in these different cities, but there's really no organization. There's no, um, there's no leadership. There's nothing in place per se. So now they're going to go back through this region and establish the churches and encourage the disciples. So that's what we're going to look at. I had four, um, four points that I was going to um, kind of major on, if you were strengthening the souls or edification. You know, they appointed elders, so they organized the church. Um, they prayed and fasted, and then they commended all of their work to the Lord. So we're going to look at those four. Um, so 14, 21 through 28 is our text. Father, we just pray as we uh, come to study your word, you'd open our hearts and mind. Again, I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide all that goes on tonight that your name would be glorified, and that we would be encouraged and strengthened in you. <clears throat> Just ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, and when they had preached the gospel to that city, which is Derbe, and they made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Anatoch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia, now when they had preached the words in Perga, they went down to Attilia. From there they sailed to Anatok, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. Now, when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done for that with them and that he had opened the door of the faith to the Gentiles, so they stayed there a long time with the disciples. They, re they reported what God had done. They didn't report what they had done. They reported what God had done because God, you know, God has to do the work. Any spiritual work that is to be done, God will do it. Jesus said uh, that he is the vine and we're the branches and that... Um, Apart from him, we can do anything, we can, spiritually. We can do a lot in our flesh, 
But for, when the spiritual realm, we can't accomplish anything without Christ strengthening us. So, you know, that's so important, especially as we're going to be talking about how we're going to how we're going to um, address new believers, new converts, you know, who don't know anything. You know, if, if you guys remember back when you first came to faith, you know, really, what did you know? You know, it was it was all new, man. I, I wasn't even going to the church when I accepted Christ, and I didn't know anything. I tried to go live my old life, and all I knew was something was different. All I knew is now when I opened the Bible, I could actually understand it. I knew that um, the sin I used to do so easily, I couldn't do like I used to do. That's all I knew. And then, then eventually God and Cal- got brought Kathy into my life. We started going to Calvary Costa Mesa, and then the journey began. But... Um, you know, when you're born, when you're first saved, really, you don't know what happened. It's when, when you're born again, you're a new creature in Christ, but what does that mean? You know, what does that mean? It's like, that's why, you know, we have a lot of mature believers at Impact Bible Fellowship, and um, I, love the, I love what our pastor does. He stresses discipleship. He stresses prayer. He stresses being in God's word. He stresses encouraging and being involved in the younger believers lives so that we can help them grow which is what we're supposed to do so so we did a brief, brief fire with the you know the other thing i was thinking about i was looking at um, this is kind of interesting i was looking at the cities they're going through are actually in modern day our modern day would be turkey and syria you know so um we, we read the Old Testament, and, you know, sometimes I don't really understand because the, the names of things change, but it's kind of nice, kind of cool to look at what it looks like in our world and where that city is. Like, Anatok is like 12 miles, I think it was south Turkey. Uh, yeah, south central Turkey is 12 miles from the Syrian border. It's 300 miles from Jerusalem. So if Paul and Barnabas wanted to go back to Jerusalem and see the apostles, how long is that going to take them by boat and walking? You know, if we, if we went on a 300-mile trip, it would take us, what, four and a half hours if we're going the speed limit? You know, if we took Alan's Corvette, we'd probably get there in like two and a half hours maybe, you know? Um, but uh, these guys took a long time to get these places, which is, uh, you know, I just, I was really thinking about that, just how dedicated they were to their ministry. You know, I get a little sciatic pain, and I start whining like a little baby. It's like Paul gets stoned to death, and he gets up, in two days, and he's back preaching the gospel. And so what is our excuse? Anyway, okay, so i give you some water. So again, Paul gets stoned. I, I like this part because it says, it says in verse 20, it says, however, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up, he went into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe, where he went preaching. Now think about that. This guy just got stoned. I mean, none of us here have been stoned. I mean, I'm not talking about the pre-Christian days. I'm talking about with rocks. They got stoned. Two days he's up and he's, and he's preaching the gospel. He's walking to the next city. Is that not? That's amazing. You know, you know those survivor shows on TV they have where they take these people and they put them in these remote areas and they have to survive. And blah, blah. Paul would win every survivor challenge that they have. Everyone, hands down. He would be survivor of the year. He would win all the awards. He would. He's a stud. He's a stud. I was thinking about, it, man, could, would you and I get up after being a bunch of rocks thrown at us, get up and go preach the gospel on a day and a half. That's, I guess that's where Philippians 4.13, which, would, which hadn't been written yet, yet, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul was living that example right there, man. He was living, he can do all things through Christ. So, back in verse 21, it says, and when they preached the gospel into the city and they made many disciples. So now, Again, they have all these cities where we have new converts. We have, we have young believers, and we have no organized organization. We have no leadership. We have no way for them really to grow in their faith. So Paul and Barnabas, they're going to go back, and they're going to start establishing um, 
organization, appoint leaders, and uh, they're going to pray for them. They're going to fast for them. They're going to commend them. They're going to encourage them, and uh, they're going to build them up. And, uh, you know, we do the same thing here in this church, and I love that, that our pastor has such a um, shepherd's heart. You know, one of the things I have so much respect for, he's he's a friend of mine, but I have such respect for him because of his shepherd's heart. Him and Lori shepherd the flock. They shepherd the flock. And, I, you know, we've all been in different churches, and pastors don't always have a shepherd's heart. But I love that. That Because, you know what? Christ had a shepherd's heart. Christ looked out at the multitude, and he wept because they, had, they were a sheep without a shepherd. And he wants mature believers to be those people that walk alongside the lost, share the gospel, encourage young believers, pray with them, pray for them love them, and help them grow in their faith, you know, so that's kind of what we're looking at tonight, guys, and all of you have done this, I know I'm kind of preaching at the choir tonight, but you're the only one here, so that's what you get, so um, I'm going to, was talking about disciples, Here's an example. Here's the uh, definition of an ex, uh, of an example. It's one who in the Greek is mathetes, um, mathetes, one who engages in learning through instruction from another, a pupil, an apprentice. In Latin, it's a student, a learner, a follower. Every one of us here are really disciples of Jesus Christ. We're learning, we're following, we're apprenticed. Um, but with that, we're to help other people, we're to be that to other people, you know. So my theme tonight is to really uh, encourage us to find people in our world that we can mentor, that we can really disciple, that we can really be walk alongside them and um, mentor them and be patient with them because, you know, sanctification is a process and it takes time, the rest of our lifetime. So it takes time. Um, And Paul understood that. You know, Matthew Henry, I love what he says. He says, young converts are apt to waver, and a little shocks them. A little event shocks them. He also says that those that are converted need to be confirmed. Those that are planted need to be rooted. Ministers' work is to establish saints as well as to awaken sinners. I think all of us are called to... um, establish saints as well as preach the gospel and awaken sinners so that's what we're going to do tonight we're going to look at that so Paul goes back in verse 23 so when they had appointed elders in every church so he went back and he I'm gonna I'm not going to do these in order because I kind of have a reason I want to end in a certain way but he went back to organize the church in first Corinthians um, Paul gives us um, Order of the church. God is, God is a God of order. I mean, the universe, our earth, our bodies, everything he's created has order. Everything has a, a time and a place. And um, it's the same in the church. And so the only reason the church gets messed up is because people get involved. But um, if we do it the way God wants us to do it, it really functions pretty well. So Paul goes back and he appoints elders. You know, so he he finds men. Well, over in um, Acts six three, you know, this is one definition. There, we can go to Titus and we can go to First Timothy also, but over in Acts six three, you know, the apostles, the church is growing, it's growing like crazy, and uh, the apostles are getting overwhelmed with all their responsibilities, so they need help, and so. Over in uh, Acts 6, it says, Now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So 
I believe Paul used the same uh, standards as he's looking for elders to appoint over these churches. He's looking for men that are full of the Holy Spirit, that are full of wisdom, that have a good reputation in their community that he can place in spiritual leadership over these, these new churches that are going to grow, these new disciples that need leadership. So, you know, again, God is a God of order. Again, Titus and First Timothy also give you in, uh, probably deeper um, characteristics of what uh, church leadership looks like, and we're not going to get into that tonight, but just, just I know that Paul understood that he needed men full of the Holy Spirit and, and full of wisdom to make good decisions. And um, I know that our pastors uh, are prayerful and diligent and patient when they raise people up. I know that for a fact. And uh, they don't do anything out of um, haste. They don't do anything out of emotion. They do it prayerfully. They fast, they pray, and they really wait on the Lord to show them who they want to raise up. You know, so I appreciate that too, Pastor Morty and Pastor Rick. So let me find the rest. So for us, when we're a discipling a young believer, we, you know, we help them uh, to understand how to discipline their life. You know, so Paul's establishing the church. He's establishing leaders. Now, these leaders, in turn, have to disciple these young believers, right? So, you know, there's an order in it. There's things that we need to do as Christians to grow in our faith, right? Um, we're blessed in Southern California. You can get on the radio any time, of the, any day, and listen to good sermons. We've got great Bible teaching in this church. We have Pastor Marty, Rick, Pastor Joe are all gifted Bible teachers, but... You know where we grow? You know where our greatest growth is? It's in our personal time with God. When we meditate on God's word and we, we are quiet with the Lord, when we're prayerfully asking the Holy Spirit to help us understand, my greatest revelations of scripture have been in some of my, some of the coolest quiet times. When God, you know when God explodes a scripture to your, your heart? And your mind is filled with the understanding. And you know what? You don't forget that. Those lessons are not forgotten. They're written in your heart and they're in, engraved in your mind. You don't forget them. And so as they're raising up these young believers, one of the things you want, we want to do with all young believers, we want to make sure they're in God's word every day. It's, it's, it, it's an, that's an absolute to grow in the Christian faith. God's word and prayer. And those two go hand in hand. It's kind of like chocolate milk without the milk. You know, you need them both to have good chocolate milk. To have good growth, we need prayer and we need, um, we need the study of God's word. And um, so I'm sure that's what the leadership is teaching them. I know that's what we need. Then we need rich fellowship. You know, we need that time to be with other believers who encourage us. You know, there's so many people in this church that encourage me, that pray for me. I asked a number of people to pray tonight because I didn't want to. I didn't want to look like a fool up here, you know. And you, a lot of you people, a lot of you guys have taught. You get nervous, you know. Um, one for me, one of the things I don't ever want to do is miscommunicate God's word. That that is a huge deal to me, huge. So I try to be diligent to understand what I'm sharing. So, um, but. We need that fellowship. We need one another, you know. Satan loves to find that isolated believer that's weak, that he can, he can ravage. You know, he walks around like a roaring lion, looking whom he can devour. And that's what he does. And when we're separated from other believers and we're just living our life on our own, we're susceptible to being um, eaten, if you would. So... So they regular Bible study, prayer, regular church attendance for the new believer. We need to encourage new disciples, new believers. Hey, you need to be in church. You need to be with brothers and sisters. The Bible says not to forsake the gathering of the fellowship. We're to be with other believers, all of us. You know, and it's, 
you know, you miss one Sunday, and then it's like, ah, you know what, I'll just... I'll just take the next Sunday off too. And then it just, it snowballs. You know, you have to discipline yourself. The Christian walk is discipline. It's like being an athlete. You want to be an athlete and you want to be good at what you do, you have to discipline your body. You have to discipline your time, discipline your workouts, discipline what you eat. It's the same thing in the Christian walk. We have to discipline ourselves. We have to get in God's word. We have to spend time in prayer. We have to make sure we're going to church. You know, we need good fellowship. And then we need to share our faith. Because that builds our faith. The more we share our faith, the more it builds our faith. The more we proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, the easier it is to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. And that's just, that's a fact. That's just a fact. So those are the things that we encourage new believers, that we want them doing, new disciples. You know, young, uh, young Christians. They may be old in age, but they may be a young Christian. They still need to be mentored and, dis- and discipled in the same way and encouraged the same way. Okay, so then Paul, he prayed and he fasted. He prayed and he fasted. The Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And I believe prayer is one of the greatest acts of faith we can, we can uh, practice. When we're praying, we're actually exercising faith. Because who are we praying to? We're praying to the God of heaven and earth. We're praying to our Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's who we believe in. That's faith. We're trusting that he's going to hear us. We're trusting he's going to answer us. So when we pray, it's, we're practicing our faith. And the more we pray, the stronger our faith gets. There was something I'm missing here. So Paul knew that this was a, a work of God, and only God could bring it to fruition. So, you know, John 15.5 says, and I, I quoted it earlier, but it says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. I love how uh, Max Licato, in, in one of his grace books, uh, has this thing on prayer, and this is just a little part of it, but I love this part. It says, your prayers... Move God to change the world. You may not understand the mystery of prayer. You don't need to. But this much is clear. Actions in heaven begin when someone prays on earth. Again, actions in heaven begin when someone prays on earth. And I was thinking about that, and I was, just, I was thinking, we say a prayer, and God's telling these angels, okay, I want you doing this. I want you to do He starts dispatching them and sending them out and uh, coming down to help us and answer our prayers, and fight for us, and protect us, and guide us, and um, so I I like that little, I've always liked that, you know, when I think about praying, action starts happening, It's, it's kind of ironic, but God can do anything without us, but he chooses to do um, most things with us, and through us, when we pray, when we exercise faith, when we're putting our trust and faith into him. He wants us, he wants us, that's what he wants us doing, you know. So, um, again, prayer can be a mystery at times, but scripture is clear on how powerful it is. It's powerful. It's our weapon. It's how we win battles. It's how we win spiritual battles. It's how we um, guard our mind. It's how we guard our heart We're through prayer. I mean, Pastor Marty is really good at asking for people to pray for him all the time. He has like a SEAL team uh, of prayer warriors, if you would. But, you know, I asked a number of my group. I sent out to my group when I knew I was going to be teaching these two studies. I said, guys, start praying for me. I need your prayers. You know, that's the spiritual battle. I don't, I don't want to, for me personally, I don't want to ever rely on myself because it's going to be ugly. And, you know, I didn't want to get tarred and feathered tonight, so I thought we'd pray a lot. I thought it would be looking. I don't look good in tar and feathers, okay? Um, so, again, the key, one of the keys is we're, we're um, um, discipling younger believers. We're praying for them, and we're praying with them, and we're teaching them how to pray as we pray. Um, but the prayers for them, that's why I love our, the counseling ministry, prayer and share. The first word is prayer. And then share. 
the prayers, because it's a spiritual battle when you're, and a number of you have counseled uh, marriage counseling and different kinds of counseling, and when you do, it's a spiritual battle. Satan has got a foothold in this marriage. He's just, he's almost got him divorced. He's almost got this family tore apart. And now we're battling against hell to save this marriage, which is God's will. So, you know, it's imperative that we keep praying for the young disciples, young believers, um, constantly be praying for them, you know. There's, there's our power. There's our victory. You know, we, we have no idea. I think when we get to heaven, we're going to be shocked at how many prayers, what our prayers actually did. God shows us a video or however he's going to do it. He'll have some high-tech thing, far anything I can imagine. But he'll show us, hey, remember when you prayed this? He's going to, like, look at that, and you're going to go, whoa, really? I didn't think it did anything. I thought I was just talking to the ceiling. But uh, it actually impacted a life in a, in a huge way. So keep praying. Prodigals, keep praying. You want change in your life? Keep praying. You want victory? Keep praying. Keep praying. Don't stop. Pray without ceasing. And everything through prayer. Everything. Again, that's a, one of the emphasis of this church is prayer. You know, a lot of people are intimidated to pray. Um, we, are, we are who are mature believers need to emulate, encourage, and pray for them. I remember when uh, Kathy and I were first married, we're a young couple, we're young Christians. And so we were, gonna, we were um, doing a nightly, a daily devotion together at night. And um, so we sat down to do the devotion, and I, I don't know if it was before or after, but I said, okay, you pray first, and then I'll pray. And she said, no, you go ahead and pray. She goes, I don't, I don't, I don't want to pray. You pray. I said, no, you have to pray first, and then I'll pray. And she says, no, you pray, and I'll, I'm going to be here, but I, you just pray. Honey, you need to pray, and then I'll pray. We ended up in an argument. We ended up in an argument, mad at each other for a day over what? Because, you know, it was stupid, but that's the enemy. You know, that's the reality of how the enemy works. So he, we took an, an awesome time that God wanted to bless. We got in our flesh, and it didn't, it didn't turn out too well. I don't do that anymore. I've learned my lesson, man. I'm, I'm patient. I try to be the spiritual leader in our home. And if my wife doesn't feel like praying for whatever reason, no problem, honey, let's pray. So, you know, but I didn't do that as a young man always, so I should, probably shouldn't have shared that story. Huh? You remember that? There was an old show for you guys that are old enough. There was a, um, um, was a show called Kung Fu, David Carradine. You guys remember that? And he would say something like, uh, patience is a virtue grasshopper or something like that. <laughs> so we need to be patient with young believers, too. We need to, to uh, understand that it takes time to grow. You know, it takes time to grow. One thing I've learned as a coach, as a Christian, but as a coach, when you got a, a young freshman coming in, maybe they're a very talented athlete, and you can see the potential. A friend of mine calls it speaking in the language of potential. Um, you can see what this athlete, the potential they have, how good they can be and how far they can go. But it takes a lot of patience and training and um, stick to it in this. To, to help them reach that, um, reach their potential. It's the same in the Christian realm. It's the same in the Christian walk. You know, sometimes we can get frustrated. Maybe we're discipling someone or counseling someone and they're not getting it yet or they're whatever. We need to be patient. We need to keep, we need to keep praying, keep encouraging. Remember, God doesn't give up on us. I look at my own life, how many times the Lord let me slip up and fall down. The Bible says a righteous man falls down seven times and gets back up. Well, I'm, I'm a lot more than seven. So um, God's patient. You know, he's, he's um, long-suffering. And uh, part of being Christ-like is to be patient and long-suffering uh, with people that we're discipling. And it's hard sometimes. But then, then we get back to that prayer thing. That's when we need to pray. So. The other thing Paul did is... Uh, Paul fasted, you know, with the prayers he fasted. And, uh, you know, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, 
take up his cross and follow me. And fasting, when we fast, we're denying ourselves. We're denying our flesh. We're denying food or drink or maybe um, our phone or watching TV, something. We're setting aside to say, Lord, I'm going to deny this for a period of time so I can concentrate on you. That I'm going to specifically have prayers about maybe a certain thing, a certain person, a certain situation. But fasting is denying ourselves, And that, you know, Paul talked about fasting and prayer. And again, they go hand in hand because when, you know, we fast from food and we get hungry, that's a great time to start praying. It replaces that time we would have eaten with prayer. So Paul knew that it was important to fast, to pray, and to fast um, because he was establishing Christian churches in non-Christian environments. They were secular places. They weren't, they weren't liked. The Jews hated them, and the Romans hated them. So they were establishing these churches. So these believers, you know, Paul says, and we're going to go over it, but Paul says when he was talking about um, exhorting them, he said, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. If anyone tells you the Christian walk is easy, they're lying to you. It's not easy. It's hard. But, uh, and there's a lot of trials. You know, every time they preached the gospel, they had just about every city, they had opposition. People hated them. The, and, it, and it wasn't the people. It's just they're, they're being inspired by Satan. Satan hates the gospel. The gospel saves souls. Satan doesn't want to give up those souls. He has control of those souls. God wants them back. So, you know, in the same um, aspect of for us, it's a spiritual battle, man. It's real. This is a real thing. And um, that's why we need to be prayed up, encouraging one another in God's word, you know, walking in his spirit. Um, that's how we have victory in the, in the Christian walk. And it's, but it's not easy. And I like the fact that Paul was honest about that. He didn't say, hey, everything's going to be, you know what, you're going to get a brand new chariot. You're going to get, um, you know, you're going to have a pot full of gold. You're going to have all the food you want. Everything's going to be awesome. He didn't tell them that. He said, you're going to suffer. It's going to be hard. But he also exhorted them, encouraged them, and prayed for them. So I think also when we disciple, we need to be realistic on how we're uh, sharing the Christian walk with people. Because sometimes people get disillusioned. You know, they think they there's some people think that everything's going to be great now. God's going to take care of everything. And yeah, God takes care of things. But I mean, ultimately, what's his goal? His goal is that we are holy. Be ye holy because I am holy. That's his God. That's his, his God's desire for us is to be Christ like to be holy. Um, it isn't to be happy. There's nowhere in the Bible that says God wants us to be happy. He wants to have joy which is a deeper emotion, but he wants us to be holy. He wants to live a life of holiness. We're being prepared, guys. We're being prepared to serve him in his millennial kingdom for a 1,000 years. We're going to have leadership roles. Alan will probably have like 100 cities. I mean, he's a faithful servant, you know? I mean, really, you know, I make it to be Marty's gardener. I don't, but that's okay. I don't care. But we're going to have roles in, in heaven. And what we're doing, what God's doing right now is preparing us for what he wants us to do in the next, our, our next chapter. So anyway, that's kind of exciting, though, isn't it? Uh, it's exciting to me. Okay, so along with prayer and fasting, Paul commended the churches and the elders and, and, and disciples to God. Uh, again, this is a work of God, started by God through the Holy Spirit, uh, using Paul and Barnabas, and would only continue effectively through prayer and God's word. You know, we dedicate our children when they're young, our baby, our children, or our babies to God, um, recognizing that they're a gift from God, but ultimately they belong to God. And Paul knew this too. Paul knew that these new believers belonged to God. They, were, they belonged to Christ. And he needed to commend them back uh, through prayer, um, give them back to God. He said, Lord, I did my job. You know, I did what you called me to do. These people have come to faith. But, Lord, I need you to 
We're trusting in you to help them grow in their faith, to protect them, to provide for them, to help them keep pushing on, um, to, uh, to, uh, to keep raising up more believers, to keep helping one another. So um, we do the same thing, and we commend people. We, we are dedicating them to God. I think all of us that you know have kids or grandkids or close family, we commend them to God. We're constantly praying for them, taking them to the Lord, taking them before his throne. And I think that's very important that we do that. You know, when we're counseling somebody, mentoring somebody, that we keep commending them back to God. They belong to God. Only God can change a human heart. You and I can't do it. One man sows, one man waters, but God brings the increase. So only God can change the human heart. Only God changed your heart and my heart. God's Holy Spirit did that. You know, it wasn't any person in our life. There were tools that came along, people that were used to help us, but God changed our heart. And God will change their heart and our and the young disciples' heart if we keep them in God's word, keep them praying. We keep praying for them. We keep encouraging them. I keep reiterating the things we need to do, but these are these are important. These are these are fundamentals, if you would, of the Christian faith. Christian faith of how we want us to grow and to help them grow. Remember this. I, lo- I love this saying, though. Strength is restored when hope is restored. Philippians 3. It's going to read Paul's uh, exhortation in, in Philippians 3.12, where he says that, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. You know, I've used that in counseling a number of times just to remind people of letting go of the past and pressing forward to the new life we have, the crown that we're, we're all um, li- trying to attain, that crown in Christ, that he, the one he will give us. So um, I like Paul that he, he recognized that this was my old life, but this is my new life and this is what I'm doing. Um, one of my models in life is one day at a time for the rest of my life. And that's why I tell um, guys, people I counsel and stuff, hey, it's one day at a time for the rest of your life. You know, take care of today. John Wooden said, make each day your masterpiece. So today's the day I get to make my masterpiece. If, I, if God gives me tomorrow, tomorrow I get to make that my masterpiece. And that's the day I need to try and honor Christ and, and live a holy life, impacting my world for him. So, you know, these are all great scriptures to use when we're discipling young people believers to help them understand you know we all have this past but we're to lay it aside we'll remember things but you don't dwell on them you just move on the good and the bad there may be good things if you've been a christian for a long time there's things you can think about great great victories but you know what we're not to dwell on that anymore than we are to dwell on the guilt that we have from past sins we're to lay that on and keep pushing forward man the next day keep going right you guys with me? Get me? Okay. Don't leave me yet. We're almost done. Um, again, sanctification, it's a lifelong process of growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ. You know, the, uh, the Bible says we're to edify, to build up one another daily. Discouragement's a real thing. It's a, re- it's a very real strategy by the enemy. You know, have you ever been discouraged? Have you ever wanted to give in? Have you ever wanted to give up? Have you ever wanted to move out of California? You know, I mean, God understands that. That's why he says, you know, in 2 Thessalonians, but as for you, brethren, don't grow weary in doing good. We get tired. We get discouraged. You know, life can be hard. And that's why we need to be praying for one another and helping one another and encouraging one another, you know, I like, the, I like the fact that Paul was honest with the new believer in churches when he said we must, through 
Many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. We need to be real and honest with new believers, but also always give hope. We always want to give hope. Romans uh, 4.13, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I tell counselees that whatever script promise you take, whatever command God gives you, put 4.13 at the end of that. You know, uh, God tells men, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church, right? We need Philippians 4.13 at the end of that. We need Christ to help us do that. We need Christ to give us the strength and, and understanding and wisdom to be able to, to execute that, right? I mean, you can go through all the different prom, uh, things that the Bible says we need to do, but if we put 413 at the end of it, now it's doable. Now I don't get discouraged. Now I can do it because Christ said he'll do it. He can do it. He, he'll help us do it. So, and, you know, Romans eight twenty eight. you know, all things do work together for good. Those are love. Love the Lord and called according to his purpose. These are promises we can give people, new believers that may be struggling. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such is common to man. But God is faithful. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. It's comforting to know that other believers go through the same struggles we go through, that other people have the same struggles we have, then we don't feel like a weirdo. We don't feel like it's just me. You know, it's, it, uh, there's a comfort in that. But then God says, hey, I'll help you through that. You know, I'll work things out for your good. You know, we're looking at eternity here, not just temporal. So anyway, I think it's, in, it's always um, a good thing to remember that new believers like we do, they struggle. As a mature believer, you don't you don't major on the minors anymore. You don't make the mountains out of the uh, molehills, but they still do. And so we need to be patient. Keep reminding them, uh, here's what the Bible says. Here's what God says. Here's what the Lord says. And uh, it, it helps. It encourages them. And then they start kind of getting it a little bit, you know. And we just keep at it. We keep encouraging. We keep helping. You know, Gary's got that young adults man. These are young they're not high school kids no more, but they're not really on their own yet. And uh, that's an age that they need to know this kind of stuff. And that's what Gary and Elisa, Alicia, Alicia are, Alicia, Alicia. I need some coffee. Um, that's, <laughs> you got any? I love chocolate milk. Um, anyway, that's what they're doing with these young adults, you know, helping them get prepared to, when they get out in the world they have their faith uh, secure so they don't get eaten up out there. Okay. Again, strength is restored when hope is restored. I love that. You know, we need to always give hope. And the last thing we're going to go over which was one of the first ones, actually. If I can find it. I lost my spot. Isn't that bad? Okay, um, I was going to read Acts 3, 19. It says to repent. Repent, therefore, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. The word translated for refreshing refers to restoration of strength and nourishment. You know, again, that's that little saying, strength is restored when hope is restored. Well, where does our hope come from? Our hope comes from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Is it not the work that Jesus did on the cross when he shed his blood for our sins? Is that not our hope? Is it not the fact that he rose from the dead and conquered death and the fear of death? Is that not our hope? Is it not his promises? Don't we hope in his promises? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Or how about nothing can separate you from my love? Or the work I started in you, I will complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. Those are our, that's our hope. So when we get discouraged or when a brother or sister is discouraged, hope is, re, strength is restored when hope is restored. As we can share biblical uh, truths with somebody that may be discouraged and they can see the promises God made to them, um, it gives them hope. And when their hope is restored, their strength is restored, and they're ready to get back into the fight. So it's important that we are always ready to encourage somebody, to pray for somebody. You know, I see Alan McGuide every Sunday, man. He prays for everybody he talks to, he prays for. I mean, seriously. Um, I saw him praying to the table with the table one time. No one was even there, and he's praying to the table. Alan just looks for people to pray for, to encourage, and to lift them up. And uh, I think that's a great example for me to be more like that. So, again, our strength is restored when our hope is restored. Jesus is both our hope and he's our strength. Father, I thank you that you love us. I thank you for your word, for your Holy Spirit, for your promises. Lord, you know that we're just dust. You know, you know our you know who we are. You know what we are. But you love us. You love us with an everlasting love, Lord. I just pray tonight, Lord, as we go into prayer, that Father, you would hear our petitions, that you would uh, answer our petitions, that Lord, we'd please you. Um with our prayers tonight. We just thank you that you love us. We thank you that you give us hope. We thank you that you give us strength when we need it. We thank you that you fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you put your Holy Spirit in us as a uh, seal to say, hey, I sealed this one. They're sealed. They're mine. They're not going anywhere. Father, thank you for that. I did I bless the rest of this evening. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can take over. Get the real pastor up here. Hey, how are you doing? Well, what if we're going to have a public prayer? Then I don't think I need a microphone, right? Because you're not going to have a microphone, right? So we're going to have a time of corporate prayer.